نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراث المستقيم سراث الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولانا محمد تب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله we'll continue talking about نبي موسى عليه السلام and if you remember last time we were talking when he had was taking the children of Israel out of Egypt and the order came from Allah SWT to take them out and this was all at night so in the middle of the night all of them get together and they head out and so the next day when the Egyptians wake up and they see well you know they're all gone Pharaoh of course is upset you know, because his slave labor is, is has left him uh, so he gets his army and they start pursuing uh, the children of Israel and Musa salam. and you know of course they have a head start and as the children of Israel and Musa salam approach the sea they can now see the army of Pharaoh coming after them and so they're saying to Musa salam that you know they're going to catch up with us, they're going to you know, destroy us, they're going to kill us. And some of them are going to the extent of, oh, you know, you, to Musa al-Islam, that you've destroyed us. And we will see this a lot more. But, uh, and this is a point that I'm going to come back to later on. But, uh, you know, even before, while they're in Egypt, you know, when things would be going good, you know, they would be getting some uh, autonomy or freedom. Uh, from the oppression that, that they were suffering under Fir'aun after Musa al-Islam had come, well, they were all for Musa al-Islam then. But, you know, when the test would come for them and things would get harder, then it would be like, not all of them, but many of them would be like, oh, you know, oh, Musa, you know, you, you, we were better off without you. You know, you've destroyed us. What have you done? And we will see this more and more even later on. Uh, especially even after they cross the sea. Uh, this is a kind of interesting point to understand uh, as well because there are many aspects of this uh, that apply to us today. You know, our attitude toward Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and toward Islam in general. Uh, you know, when things are good, ah, oh, you know, we're great. And when difficulties come, which they're expected to come because Allah Subhanahu wa did not, you know, leave us alone when we say we believe. You know, if we believe, then we need to be ready to prove that we believe. And, and the price uh, of the love of Rasulullah is in reality everything because there's nothing in this world that is more precious than the love of Rasulullah. So we should be ready to give up everything and anything. And if we're not ready for that, then we need to question our own iman. And so, you know, we see this in the situation of Musa alayhi salam uh, many times. And we'll also see this in the situation of the other prophets that were sent to the children of Israel. Uh, 
you know, so even here they're saying, oh, you know, he's going to come and he's going to destroy us. And oh, Musa, you know, we were better off if we had, you know, stayed uh, where we were. And so and Musa Islam, he addresses them. And he says that my Lord is with me. Uh, he doesn't say that my Lord is with us. And which is interesting because Rasulullah when Abu Bakr radiallahu is with him in, in the in the cave of, of Thor, you know, as they're escaping Mecca to emigrate to Medina Munawwara. And Abu Bakr radiallahu is concerned. There's a huge difference here. You know, here the children of Israel weren't concerned for Musa, Islam. They were concerned for themselves. Whereas Abu Bakr radiallahu was not concerned for himself. His concern was solely for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, and so when he says to Rasulullah Ya Rasulullah, you know, they're upon us. Rasulullah tells him not to worry. Inna Allah ma'ana. You know, don't worry. Allah is with us. Musa al-Islam says, my Lord is with me. One question that comes from this is, or this aspect of things as well. You know, I asked two questions early on. Uh, one was that, why did the other prophets ask Allah SWT, show me this, show me how you give life, show me how you give death. Uh, whereas Rasulullah never asked this question. And we've addressed this question already. The second question that I had asked earlier, which we have not addressed and we will address soon, inshallah, was that why do you have the followers of other prophets and especially here the followers of Musa al-Islam that will eventually ask him you know, to show them Allah otherwise we won't believe whereas we never get this type of question from the followers of Ras or from the companions I won't say from the followers but from the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu so why not what's the difference A third question, you know, so I've answered one or discussed one. Uh, I still have one to discuss from these two, but I'm going to throw in a third question into the mix, which is why, you know, when you have the children of Israel, you know, even after they give their prophets so much trouble, you know, I mean, as we'll see how they troubled Musa al Islam to, so extensively that he even prays against them. Yet they still remain a favored nation that Allah SWT continues to send more messengers to them, specifically to them. And they, again, they remain a favored nation or the favored nation at the time. And even later on, you know, they disobey so many prophets to the extent they even have many prophets killed. And there is an incident where in one day, because Allah SWT would send them multiple prophets at the same time, in one day they killed 300 prophets. And yet they still remained a favored nation. Even after rejecting all these other prophets. But then when they rejected Isa salam and didn't even have him killed, they tried to have him killed. Now, they are no longer the favored nation. So what is the difference in them, in them disobeying other prophets and disobeying Isa alayhi salam? You know, what changed that they went from being the favored nation to now being a cursed nation? So this is another important po in, in question to think about, and we will get to that, inshallah. Uh, of course, I have to get to number two, which I'll get to soon. Uh, but so when Musa al-Islam, you know, when they get to the sea, and all of his people are behind him, and and behind them are the is the arm is Pharaoh and his army coming fast. You know, and Musa al-Islam tells them, don't worry, Allah is with me. 
So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires him to strike the sea with his staff. Uh, and in reality, there's nothing special in the staff other than its connection to Musa alayhi salam. And that connection makes the staff in itself special because it is connected to him. You know, the same staff that when he throws it becomes a serpent, he picks it up, becomes a staff again. Now that same staff, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders him to strike the sea. And he says, we will make a way for them. And so Musa al Islam, he strikes the sea. And the sea splits. And it's described in the Quran, you have mountains of water on the sides. In the middle, you have a path, clear path. And so Musa al Islam, along with the children of Israel, they take the path. And all of these signs are being shown. And they're crossing. And when Pharaoh's army, you know, when they reach the water, or they reach the path, because by that time there's still the path, you know, they hesitate initially, they look. Of course, you know, Pharaoh claiming to be God, he should have the authority to do this. He should have the authority to, you know, you know, if he wanted to destroy the children of Israel, he could have just, you know, ordered the water. He should have just ordered the water to come crashing down on them. But of course, you know, he has no authority. And so they decide to pursue Musa al Islam and his people. And they do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran in Surah uh, Yunus, you know, he talks about this. Uh, they pursued them. And as they, as the children of Israel exit the other side, and Musa is standing there watching this army coming, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now orders the water to go back to its regular self. And you can imagine these mountains of, of, of water coming crashing down on this army uh, to the extent that nothing is left. other than Fir'aun. You know, Fir'aun is now drowning in the water. And as this is happening, now he calls out. And he says that, I believe that there is no God other than the God of the children of Israel, you know, with the God that they follow. You know, the God of Harun and Musa, alayhi salam. You know, I believe there's no other God other than them, than this one God. Acknowledging that he himself is not God. I mean, he's still not dead. He's dying, but he's still not dead. And Allah subhanahu wa response to him is, Al-An, now? You know, just a minute ago, you were in, in blatant disregard and, and, and aggression against you know, the people of, of Allah. And now, suddenly, you have this change of heart, you know, when death is flashing in front of you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also promises him that he says, I will preserve your body, you in your body, to be a sign for later generations to come. Uh, Surah Yunus, verses 90 through 92. And uh, this is mentioned. And so, this is a very interesting point, and there are several things that I'm going to come to now, uh, more from a scientific standpoint. And you know, when we look at uh, the way Quran reveals knowledge, knowledge that could not have been known by anyone at that time, other than the one who's receiving, or who who has been taught by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala Himself. And it shows us the miracle of the Qur'an. It shows us the knowledge of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he is the explanation to that miracle of the Qur'an. One is that, you know, when we get to Fir'aun and, and the buildings that he erected, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala talks about these buildings, uh, he also talks about the destruction of these buildings. 
you know, that he uh, basically destroyed them. And it's interesting to see how they were destroyed. Because he talks about preserving Fir'aun as a sign for later generations. You know, and the body of Fir'aun was exhumed in 19, or 1898. You know, because all of these buildings were covered up by sand. You know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala just flattened them, or rather, flattened the earth around over them. Uh, because you know, you have the desert, you have sandstorms, and all of these buildings that this Pharaoh had built were flat. But if you remember, you know, when Musa al Islam came and, and addressed Pharaoh, and Musa al Islam had said to him, you know, about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, that Rabbus Samawati wal Ard wa ma baynahuma. You know, that my Lord is, is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in between. Pharaoh said to Haman, he says to him, he says, kindle the fire. You know, to bake the clay and make a tower for me so I can see. You know, I can, I can challenge this Lord of Musa. Yeah. If you look at like the the uh, pyramids in Giza. And the tallest of those pyramids was the tallest building in the world until the 1900s. Mm -hmm. And until recently, you know, because scientists have been talking back and forth as to how they built these, you know, how the Egyptians were able to build these structures, you know, which, you know, even modern day equipment, you know, they could not build which is interesting because you know the the accuracy with which the uh, pyramids were put together is so accurate that there's no tool even today to really know how accurate it is because you know if you look at any tool it'll tell you it has like plus or minus so much you know range of error uh, and these these things are so precise that there's no range of error that, that we have tools for today that can actually measure it. And so they, scientists have gone back and forth, you know, as to, well, what type of stone did they use and where did they get this stone from? Because we don't know of any stone like this. But the most recent theory, which is what fits with what is in the Quran, is again, Fir'aun is telling Haman, kindle the fire to bake the clay. But the most recent theory is that these aren't stones that they brought in, but these are large baked bricks. And, and when they analyze them, you know, the temperature that they have to get the clay, they could take the clay from the Nile and the temperature that they'd have to get it to is, is just, you know, mind boggling. But it can be done. And there's no way that anybody at the time of Rasulullah knew this. Because even the concept of baking the clay stones, you know, it really in Arabia wasn't a concept because they would simply bake the clay. You know, if they wanted to make bricks, they'd bake it in the sun. But kindling a fire, getting it super, super hot. You know, because in order to get the fire super hot, you have to feed it extra oxygen, and, and there are other ways of doing that, and ways that they could have done it then. But, you know, you'd almost have to get it like volcanic levels, as far as the heat, and then those, and that explains a lot of, well, how did they build this? Because there's, you know, you can't bring all of this stone in. And there are remnants of, of, pyramids that they think may have been even larger than the largest pyramid in, in Giza. But Allah Subhanahu wa says he destroyed those. But if you look at also the remnants and where they exhumed all these uh, these certain pharaohs from, and especially, you know, most people again think that it was probably Ramses II where they exhumed him and he was exhumed in 1898, is that, you know, sandstorms came and just covered everything. And there was nothing left. So even the even the Egyptians at the time of Rasulullah had no knowledge of all of this other stuff in the past.
when we look at you know the you know Allah Subhanahu wa says that I preserve your body for generations to come later. Uh, it's interesting because when again when Ramses was was exhumed in 1981, France requested that you know this mummy be sent to them for autopsy, and they had certain connections, and so the body was or the body of uh, Pharaoh was sent there. And when they did the autopsy, they came to the conclusion that he had been drowned in the sea and taken out very quickly afterwards because of the salt contents and everything and with everything that was there. Which is an interesting point because one of the people involved in this process was a doctor, a French doctor named Maurice Bacall, who wrote the famous, his famous book of the Quran and the Bible and science. Or my, yeah. I think that's the title. Last comes science, the Quran, the Bible, and science. He became Muslim not long after this, but one of the things that drove him, or one of the proofs that that reinforced his his inclination toward Islam, was that according to the Bible version, you know. Pharaoh did not drown in the sea. His army drowned going after Musa al Islam, but he remained alive and came back to Egypt you know, and then you know, died later there. Whereas, of course, we as Muslims and Quranically we know that Pharaoh drowned in the sea. And so when they did the autopsy, this was consistent again with somebody drowning in the sea. You know, and not just drowning, but drowning in the sea because of the salt contents and stuff. So these are very interesting points to, to note. You know, even if you know, the scientists came to a different conclusion, it wouldn't change our Iman at all. This simply strengthens it because we know, okay, you know, this is what we already know. You're not telling us anything new. You know, this is why you know, people talk about scientific facts in the Quran. The Quran is the Quran. You know, if the science agrees with the Quran, then that gives credence to the science. It doesn't give credence to the Quran. Yeah. Uh, and that's an important point to understand too. That the Quran stands by itself. You know, when we see these other things affirm what is in the Quran, well, in reality, the Quran is simply affirming what they're saying. You know, and so. Uh, Uh, so, inshallah, I'll end here. I think I've gone over today uh, as far as time. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa help us. We'll continue from here and we'll start talking about what the children of Israel did after Musa al-Islam gets them to the other side and they've seen all of these signs. Because that's also important to understand related today to today is, again, people were being all, shown all these signs and they ignored them which in reality we're doing even worse than that today. And I'll explain that later, inshallah, maybe next time. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, guide us and, and fill our hearts with His true love because that is guidance, is His love and the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah, guide us through the straight path and fill our hearts with your true love and the true love of your beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, uh, raise us up in a give us give us all the death of deaths of martyrs, uh, and raise us up in a condition where you and your beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are pleased with us, and we are pleased with you. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammadin wa Ali wa Sallam, Ya Rahman Ya Rahim.